Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the New School. My name is Alex Schwartz. I'm a professor here in the uh, program in public and urban policy at the Milano School of Management, uh, Policy Management and Environment here at the New School. The New School is very proud to join The Nation magazine this evening in presenting uh, this event, Sanders versus Warren, Time to Choose. While the New School, this is a disclaimer, while the New School does not endorse any particular candidate for political office, we do welcome opportunities to hear perspectives, proposals, and insights from political leaders, scholars, advocates, and others. Every day at the New School, our students debate pressing policy issues that all presidential candidates face. These urgent issues include the climate crisis, racial and um, economic justice, housing affordability and homelessness, the rising cost of health care, and especially urgent to us here at the New School, the rising cost of education. Tonight's event invites our panelists and all of you here in the audience and those joining us via live stream to think about where you stand on these issues and how we as Americans can influence the policy priorities for our elected officials. After tonight's event, we invite you to visit the Milano School's website at newschool.edu slash Milano to learn more about our graduate programs in public, urban, and environmental policy. Thank you again for joining us now. Please join me in welcoming Katrina Vanden Heuvel, Editorial Director and Publisher of The Nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry Thank I can't you. Good evening. Um, the, welcome. The Nation has long been a venue for passionate, intelligent debate and discussion on the progressive left. Over a year ago, we argued for the importance of what we called the, quote, ideas primary, which we believe gave reformers, activists, grassroots groups their best opportunity to have an impact on the political debate. And so it has, dramatically widening the left lane of our politics. Thanks to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's courage and clarity of vision, ideas once dismissed as radical, ideas the nation has long championed, even when they or we were called marginal or radical, think Medicare for all, Green New Deal, universal health care, I could go on, have played a really important role in framing the Democratic Party and the debate. Now, truth is plenty of progressives like both Sanders and Warren, yet we also know that at some point we will have to choose. And it's that spirit and understanding that inspired and inspires tonight's debate. And the debate will be moderated by Nation editor Don Gutenplan. Don was one of the nation's lead correspondents in the 2016 presidential campaign and author of a book informed by the insurgencies of that campaign, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. He was my invaluable co-editor on the nation's 150, 150th anniversary special issue and author of The Nation, a biography. Don wrote the magazine's powerful call to arms, welcome to the fight in the dark hours after the 2016 election. And I recommend that you read his acclaimed biography, American Radical, The Life and Times of I.F. Stone, if you're interested in the role of independent journalism in our country. So tonight, Don will moderate, and I'm very pleased that he's become editor at a crucial time in the nation's and the nation's life. Onwards in solidarity. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, to time to choose question, Sanders versus Warren. And welcome to the New School, and my thanks to Katrina for a typically gracious introduction. Uh, my thanks to the New School for agreeing to host this event. Uh, and my thanks to all of our participants uh, who've generously agreed to come and argue with each other in front of you all. Now, I have to say that I've been, I've been hearing a lot of banter and laughter in the green room, so that's over now, guys. Remember, this is no, no more fun. Um, I can't see very well out there, but I want to take a quick read of the room before I introduce our debaters, because we're, we're not going to, this is not an Oxford Union debate. We're not going to call the question at the end. But I think it's useful to know where people stand to begin with. So how many people here Hold up your hand if you haven't yet decided who you're going to vote for in whatever state primary you vote in. Okay, well, that's, 
So now you know what there is to play for. That's the stakes. <laughs> And now, uh, how many of you are, are inclined towards uh, Bernie Sanders? OK. Uh, you can make a little noise if you want. Go ahead. OK. Now, how many of you are inclined towards Elizabeth Warren? OK, good. Uh, based on a scientific reading and censors and everybody's seats, I would say it's a pretty evenly divided room, which is great. That was what we were hoping for. Thank you very much. So, um, as some of you know, uh, because you're devoted Nation readers, and God bless you, and if you subscribe to Nation, God bless you twice, uh, or if you donate money to us, um, we have avoided making a choice up until this point, and indeed, I I've often argued that we didn't need to choose. And I felt it was important to have a question mark in the, in the question tonight, because uh, while we are here to hear cases forceful, passionate uh, for each of these two uh, progressive candidates. Uh, it's also important that we bear in mind both how much they have in common and how important it's going to be for all of us who support either of them to come together uh, and work hard for whichever of them wins the nomination. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, OK, so uh, without further ado and in alphabetical order, Brad Lander, second from my left, <laughs> is a member of the New York City Council, the Council's Deputy Leader for Policy, and co-founder of the Council's Progressive Caucus. Together with Jermaine Williams, Brad sponsored legislation in partnership with Communities United for Police Reform that helped to end Mike Bloomberg's discriminatory stop and frisk. Please feel free to boo. We, we clap for Brad, but how do we feel about stop and frisk? Little, little, yeah, that's good. Okay, good. <laughs> Working together with labor unions and workers' organizations, Brad has led successful fights to win groundbreaking laws that protect freelancers from wage theft. Thank you. Give fast food workers a fair work week. And to guarantee Uber and Lyft drivers earn a living wage. Brad also serves as chair of Local Progress, a national network of over 1,000 progressive local elected officials in 45 states. So thank you, Brad. <laughs> Morris Mitchell, to my immediate left, <laughs> now, is it Maurice? It is Maurice. My apologies. The yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I've been in England too long. Yeah. The national director of the Working Families Party is a widely recognized. Yes, let's. Okay, let's hear it for the Working Families Party. Good. Is a widely recognized social movement strategist, a visionary leader in the movement for black lives, and a community organizer for racial, social, and economic justice. Maurice worked as a longtime community and political organizer in New York, organizing diverse communities. After Mike Brown was murdered by police in Missouri, Maurice relocated to Ferguson to support organizations on the ground responding to police violence. Maurice joined the Working Families Party in August 2018 and led the national organization through a successful midterm election season that ended Republican control of legislative chambers in New York and Colorado. <laughs> Definitely deserving of applause and ousted conservative corporate Democrats in states from New Mexico to Maryland to Rhode Island. This year, the WFP has won a raft of municipal races across the country, from the public advocates election in New York City to school board elections in Milwaukee to city council races from Phoenix to Chicago to Morgantown, West Virginia. All right. Baskar Sankara on my far left, <laughs> is the founding editor and publisher of Jacobin Magazine. I'm going to interject a small commercial here and say that if you don't subscribe to Jacobin Magazine, you should. I was going to say, because I believe what I read on Twitter, always a mistake, that Jacobin is 21 and therefore we should buy them all a drink. 
You can't yet buy them a drink, but you can buy yourself or your friends a subscription, and I recommend you do. I always learn something from Jacobin. Uh, and he is also uh, editor and publisher of the UK-based Tribune magazine and Catalyst, A Journey of Theory and Strategy. He's a columnist for The Guardian US and the author of The Socialist Manifesto, The Case for Radical Politics in an Era of Extreme Inequality. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, my, my friend Zephyr Teachout, and I'm sure you can figure out which one is Zephyr, is an associate law professor at Fordham Law School, the author of three books, including Corruption in America, a book I also recommend you buy, and the forthcoming Break Em Up. She's a leading anti-corruption scholar and lawyer, and her work appeared most recently in the House Judiciary Committee's impeachment report. She is one of the, the few sadly few, emoluments experts. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's a really important subject. And if there were more emoluments experts, there would have been a much stronger article of impeachment. Uh, and was a lawyer on the first ongoing case against Trump for taking foreign governmental money, a case that is still ongoing in district court here in Manhattan. She has run for office, endorsed by The Nation magazine, I'm proud to say, most recently for New York State Attorney General, where she was also endorsed by the New York Times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she is a proud member of the nation's editorial board. So a couple of small procedural points. We tossed a coin, and the uh, Sanders party are going to go first, uh, which means that the uh, Warren party are going to have the last word at the end. We're going to have opening statements, five minutes a speaker. We've got a timekeeper, I'm looking at you. Uh, and then we're gonna have rebuttals, which will be three minutes a speaker. Uh, and then there are gonna be a couple of questions from me to each side. And after that, assuming you're still here, which I certainly hope you will be, uh, there will be questions from the audience. We'll have microphones here. You can line up behind them. And uh, the only thing I'm gonna say at this point is that there are questions from the audience, so please keep it to questions and keep it short so that other people who are waiting behind you can get a chance to ask their questions. And then at the end, we're going to have closing statements, three minutes of speaker. So uh, without any further ado, please welcome to the podium, Bhaskar Sankara. Well, to begin with, thank you all for coming out on a Monday night. Um, and thank you so much for uh, everyone taking part. You know, I, I really appreciate the invitation. I, I learned how to canvas uh, kind of well. Uh, I'm still a pretty bad canvasser, but my first attempt at canvassing was when I was 15 or 16. Uh, I was in high school and I was canvassing for Andres uh, Stewart Cousins, and that was uh, working at Miss Marty. Um, back to race, and I think any long, Anyone who's lived in New York for a long time knows the kind of positive role of the Working Families Party. Uh, you know, Brad seems kind of nice too. Uh, but, uh, um, yes, and he claims he read my book, which I'm, you know, uh, sales have not been good, so I can't afford to, uh, to turn back anyone. So I guess I'll begin by just offering a positive case for uh, Bernie Sanders. And I'll, I'll break my case into three parts. Now, the first is that Bernie Sanders is the candidate with the deepest and most substantial background on the left. You know, this is a candidate who joined the Young People's Socialist League in the early 1960s. Um, I mean, that, again, is probably the only drawback uh, to Bernie Sanders, which is his age. I was reading Our Revolution, one of his books, lately, and he was complaining about how the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn taught him that capitalism was bad. And it was a very good sentiment, but it, it worried me a bit. I was like, that one we need to strike from the, the stump speech. But with his early experience on the left, with his experience in Yipsil, with, with his experience in the uh, civil rights movement, with his experience doing labor organizing in the 1960s, he was left with a profound uh, vision of how to make change in this country. And that was a vision that's fundamentally a vision of class struggle. The idea that the wealthy and powerful that control this country won't give up anything without a fight, and that we need to organize ordinary people 
into a broad-based coalition for change. And I think there is a simplicity to what Bernie Sanders says. There is a repetition, there's a moral clarity that comes from this early training. And I think he's held firm to his convictions over the years. Um, I think what's important to note, and I'll, I'll get into later, which is that Bernie Sanders is an outsider in uh, Washington, but he's not a fringe radical. This is someone with a long uh, uh, period of, of experience. This was someone in the 1980s who, in a still relatively conservative state and relatively conservative, though changing Vermont, was able to take power in Burlington and was able to successfully govern and administer an executive, even with hostility from the city council. This is a candidate who ran independent races throughout the 1990s and who outperformed Democrats. He outperformed Democratic uh, candidates at the presidential level and even the most conservative parts of Vermont, like Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. This isn't a candidate that just has a fringe outsider vision, says a bunch of stuff, and, and rallies the base. This is someone who actually was able to even work with the Republicans and get, when he was chairman of the Veteran Affairs Committee, get real benefits and real gains for veterans and their families. This is someone who's been able to participate in Washington while maintaining a profile as an outsider. And I think that's a perfect combination for, for a candidate. The second point is that he's a candidate that already has a mobilized and activated base. He has a small dollar fundraising base that rivals any other candidate in, in the history of the United States. It's the reason why he's brought more money into this race than any candidate other than um, the billionaires. He has activist energy, he has a mobilized constituency, and his base already has a mass character. A lot of what the Democrats were complaining about during the debate, the fact that Bernie Sanders has some supporters saying certain things on social media, and there's a certain chaos to, the, to, to um, that discourse. Of, sort, of course, we would condemn some of the statements that were, that were made, but they're a testament to a candidate that has a mass character. You know, this is a candidate that, that has activated, engaged, and mobilized people. Most importantly, Bernie Sanders is the most electable candidate in a general election. No doubt, Democrats have different pathways to victory. Perhaps a Biden as a nominee would have a greater pathway in Florida compared to Bernie Sanders or North Carolina. Perhaps Bernie Sanders' best pathway to an electoral majority is in the upper Midwest and so on. But we know that even though only one-fourth of Americans identify as liberals, there's almost two-fifths that support Medicare for All, that support a Green New Deal, that support federal uh, action on jobs, that support a shift in the US uh, uh, free trade agreements. Now, this is the type of coalition that goes beyond just the liberal coalition. And finally, this is the coalition that is more than just the ideological left. This is the mass base of American egalitarianism. And I think Bernie Sanders is the only candidate that, could, that can really mobilize that base. Thank you, Bhaskar. And now we're going to hear from Mo. All right, from Maurice. Good evening. Oh man, we're gonna. This must not be Manhattan. We'll try that again. Good evening. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, it's especially great to be sharing the stage with Don Zephyr Bhaskar and my debating partner, Councilman Lander. Uh, you know, one of the things I find most inspiring about Elizabeth Warren is that time and again, she has placed the critical importance of building a strategic and generous movement ahead of making the case for herself. So we want to take a page from that playbook tonight, and even as we debate the merits of these two outstanding candidates, we, we hope that our joint desire is to build a stronger movement together that will outlast any candidate or campaign. It's the only way, yep, okay. Now that's the only way we'll build the future we all wanna see. But let's dig in on Elizabeth Warren. So Elizabeth Warren didn't start out as a progressive. Famously, she didn't even start out as a Democrat. Um, like most folks, for much of her life, she was ideologically underdeveloped um, and accepted <laughs> the status quo orthodoxy of the time, you know, neoliberalism, trickle-down economics. 
And Elizabeth experienced life on the edge of the working class, struggling to care for her child, navigate a divorce, support her sick parents despite a perverse healthcare system, yet she persevered. She persisted, you might say. <laughs> she studied the lives of working people and how they navigate our economy. And she learned that much of the conventional wisdom she'd grown up with was flat wrong. She became a crusader against Wall Street, the big banks, CEOs, and all the ways that they rigged the system against regular people. This is why she is such an exceptional communicator to people that the left desperately needs to reach. She could convert others because she herself was a convert. Elizabeth developed a theory about how to use governing power to constrain the power of capital and create the space for structural change. And then she sought to execute that theory, first as a private citizen, and then later as a public servant. She has been fighting Wall Street and the Democrats who do the bidding of Wall Street since at least 2005, when she went up against Joe Biden over the bankruptcy bill. She was far and away the most visible, outspoken, and articulate critic of the bank bailouts and the corporate wing of the Obama administration, including Rahm Emanuel, who's on TV as often as he can, um, Larry Summers, and Tim Geithner. They hated her for it. In short, Elizabeth is tough, smart, and she knows how to kick billionaires and Wall Street financiers where it hurts. And if you didn't know that before, last week's debate in Nevada should have made that pretty clear, right? Yeah. But, but while I have a plan for that has become the catchphrase of the campaign, what's most impressive about those plans isn't their rigor or nuance or ambition, it's the fact that they represent a cohesive and coherent worldview. You can see it in how all of those plans build on each other. There's no one Green New Deal plan, for example, because she realizes that the climate crisis is so vast that we have to fight it on every front, from trade to foreign policy to infrastructure. And like few other candidates, Warren has applied a racial and gender analysis to all of her policy proposals. She gets on a gut level how one-size-fits-all solutions don't work. And that's why she has plans to eliminate redlining, bridge the racial wealth gap, reduce black maternal mort mortality, and fight the white supremacy that has supercharged the right-wing movement and paved the way for Donald Trump. There isn't a policy plank that deals with black communities. Every single one of her policies explicitly mentions and is tailored to target black communities because of the unique experience of black communities. Another thing I admire about Elizabeth Warren is her commitment to accountability. Throughout this campaign, Warren has shown an incredible willingness to change in response to evidence. You see that in the accountability pledges she's taken with groups like Black Women Four. She developed her disability plan with the assistance of people in that community. This speaks more about her commitment to inside-outside organizing rather than simply signaling wokeness, right? These plans were put together in partnership and dialogue with movement building organizations, and that's how the governing work will happen too. She's drawn from and credited Kirsten Willerband in her family lead proposals, same with Kamala Harris and her outstanding reproductive health plan. She took the best of uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris's plans and shared a marijuana legalization plan yesterday. And Jay Inslee's plan, his groundbreaking brand on the Green New Deal, he she took it in total. Elizabeth isn't a prophet, she's a partner. She doesn't just teach, she listens. She can collaborate and struggle with grassroots movements to build the forces on the outside while keeping her eyes on the levers of power inside. And that's a big part of why I'm proud to support her. Thank you. I have to say, I'm really impressed with our speaker's brilliant timekeeping. Thanks very much. And now, Zephyr Teachout. I am so excited to be here tonight. How does it feel, progressives, <laughs> to be at the center, <sighs> to be the center of the gravity of the Democratic Party? <laughs> I, 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 I told uh, Maurice and Brad that not only am I willing to fight for somebody that I don't know, but I'm so happy to fight with people that I know. <laughs> I have so much deep respect for um, the national leadership and for Brad also in, in New York, but also the national leadership 
that um, Brad and Maurice have shown in building the progressive movement to the extraordinary moment it is today. And I just want to echo Maurice's important, serious moral call, because this is actually about um, our, our coming together is actually about the well-being of all the people in this country, is we are in this fight together. <laughs> and, and, and if you ever have a moment where you're feeling a little, it can be hard, where it's like, ah, there's two candidates and I love them so much, and you feel the tension, first of all, remember Mike Bloomberg and that we have to make sure that the Democratic Party is the Democratic Party for people, not for oligarchs. And, and second, and I'll get, I'll, 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 I'm going to talk about Bernie in a second, but I actually think it's been really important that we have had not one but two strong progressives in this race. I think that has been incredibly valuable in shifting the center of gravity this year. So I've known Bernie Sanders a, a long time. I was 22 years old, and I saw a notice in the newspaper saying, come talk to your congress member about NAFTA. I was telemarketing at night for money. I was living in Vermont, which is where I grew up. And so I took the elevator up to a brown bag lunch. And in those days, brown bag lunches included bringing your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which I brought. And listen to Bernie Sanders talk about his recent visit to Mexico, his serious conversations with workers uh, in Vermont, and his decision to oppose NAFTA because of what it was going to do to workers. I, that was 1994. Now, think about 1994. Actually, it was the fall of 93. 94, the bloodbath, the Gingrich Revolution. Democrats lost seats all across the country, but not Bernie Sanders, who won in Vermont against that Republican onslaught. And I remember talking to a woman in her 80s that year. Uh, she, she said she only voted for Republicans and Bernie Sanders um, because uh, he talks about the real things, you know, like dental care. And I, just give me a second, dental care really matters and Bernie Sanders' lifelong advocacy for dental care and dental clinics, successful fighting for dental clinics around this country has transformed thousands of people's lives. Um, she said he talks about real things. He's honest, he's independent, and all the people at my hair salon feel the same way. It showed in the votes. I also got to work for him in 2006 when he was running for Senate. I did a brief job for his campaign. That year, a Republican in Vermont won the governorship. Sanders won the Senate seat with 65% of the vote. And I spent some time on the streets of Burlington where he had been mayor. And people were scared when he became mayor at first. He won by a few votes. He, his economic development in that city was extraordinary. And the naysayers came on board and supported that. And if you go to Burlington today, you can see the effects of his great mayorship. And he'd walk down the street and people would say, hey, Bernie, I've got a problem. And he would answer it, seeing his job as working for the people. I, I think. When people see Bernie Sanders, their biggest concern is not whether they share his values, because people want a Green New Deal. They want Medicare for all. They want a foreign policy built on peace and diplomacy. Their concern is just really about electability, like can I dare dream that big? I will tell you, he has won the most votes in Iowa, he won New Hampshire, and he won Nevada with an extraordinary coalition, including moderate voters and an overwhelming majority of the Latino vote, which is really going to matter for the presidential election and going to matter enormously for down-ballot races. We have polls, oh, I have end. Not me, us. Thank you, Zephyr. Remember, they'll all get another bite. And now, Councilman Lander, thank you. Thank you, Don. I'm really happy just to be Brad here. It's uh, an honor to be up here with Bhaskar and, and Zephyr and, and Maurice and this whole nation crowd. Thank you for being here. It's obviously a very unusual debate where the real goal is to build progressive solidarity for the future. 
Um, I want to drill down on Elizabeth Warren's theory of change and her interconnected approach to governance. And the model for this is obviously the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, one of the shining progressive successes of recent decades. And to make it a reality, Warren, then just a law professor with no formal power, used a canny inside-outside strategy to overcome stiff resistance from Wall Street, from Republicans, and even from within the Obama administration. And when she faced efforts to water it down, she fought like hell. My first choice, she said, is a strong consumer agency. My second choice is no agency at all and plenty of blood and teeth on the floor. My 99th choice is some mouthful of mush that doesn't get the job done. Warren understands, like few politicians, that you need a firm grasp of the plumbing, of the institutional forces, of how corruption rigs the system, and you need outside pressure from activists and people mobilizing to win any kind of big structural change. And I really admire that work, especially as an elected official. That's how we won the fight on stop and frisk. That's how we navigate internal forces to make change. That's why we joined the fight for 15 to turn poverty jobs into dignified ones, understanding the plumbing and teaming up with activists who are building the power for change. And because Elizabeth Warren did that, because she focused on the role of corruption, because she understood the plumbing, because she built a coalition and fought like hell, the CFPB has returned over $12 billion to regular Americans who were cheated out of that money by banks like Wells Fargo and Bank of America. When Elizabeth talks about big structural change, she means it and she gets it done. That's why corruption is first on her agenda, something I know very important to Zephyr, uh, because unrigging the rules is critical to weakening the stranglehold of organized money on our system and opening up the doors that make change possible. That's the logic she would bring, not just to making the CFPB, but think about it, the EPA, HUD, the Justice Department, into agencies under her leadership that work for people and not just for the powerful, you could see that same logic in her two cent wealth tax, focusing on the corruption of wealth inequality, and then using governing power to deliver universal childcare, public education, debt-free college, confronting the affordability crisis that is squeezing millions of families. And her healthcare proposal, which I'll be glad to talk about in questions, is really another good example of her plans to strategically use government power to push what's possible, even if it isn't yet. Now, of course, having the best governing strategy doesn't mean much if you don't win. And the central question that has hung over her campaign is electability. Now, let's be honest, a lot of that is simply sexist bias. It is, it is. Um, I'll say more about that later. But still, we do need to focus on the question of who can beat Trump. Now, as Maurice said, anybody who watched that Nevada debate has to love seeing what she could do on stage against an arrogant billionaire. Um, and actually, let's pause here for one more quick straw poll. Regardless of who you would support, who here would love to see Elizabeth Warren take on Donald Trump one-on-one -on, -one on the debate stage? All right, thank you. Um, Elizabeth defeated a popular moderate uh, Republican who was backed by Mike Bloomberg uh, in a state that keeps electing Republican governors, and she didn't just win. After she won that fight, she became a symbol of resurgent progressivism, willing to take on CEOs and billionaires, bringing the fight for working families back to the US Senate. Now, we have to win this year, but we also need to build durable power for the long run so we don't wind up right back here again. And that's why that theory of change is so key for the longer term. Focus on corruption, understand the plumbing, build a big coalition, fight like hell, unrig the rules, Make sure those who have been excluded by racism and sexism and the abuses of power see themselves in the fight. Use the tools of government to deliver broad, tangible benefits. Repeat. And I'll let you in on a secret. That is really every one of the plans.
Uh, it's the difference between transactional politics where maybe you win but you feel deflated by compromise and transformational politics which is still step by step but where you move inexorably toward that bigger vision because you are winning each time and you see that something is more is possible. That's what legendary democratic socialist Michael Harrington called visionary gradualism and it is what Elizabeth Warren can deliver better than anybody else. Thank you. Okay, well, I think the most important thing uh, to think about is that obviously we're all on the left in a broad sense. You know, I, I identify as a democratic socialist, not a um, you know progressive in a broad sense. But I know that throughout American history, and one of the lessons, of course, of of Michael Harrington's experience in politics is that every single progressive change that has happened in America has happened because of a coalition between the left and and liberal forces, uh, from the New Deal onward. Before that, even from the original left, the left uh, that the nation was a part of its very inception the, against the struggle against slavery onward. This was uh, the result of coalitions and alliances. But I don't think we should necessarily think in ideological terms when it comes to the general election about uniting progressives. That's not necessary. Each and every one of us are going to vote against Donald Trump. I mean, Michael Bloomberg would be a tough sell, but just about anyone else, I'm sure we would line up to vote for a Democratic candidate, even a far more imperfect Democrat than Elizabeth Warren. Now, the real question to me is, who can mobilize the three most important constituencies going forward, which is Obama to Trump voters, uh, Obama voters who stayed home, and in general, irregular and non-voters. The experience of Bernie, of Bernie Sanders, what we could tell from his electoral track record, is that he is particularly good at mobilizing these people. This is why I mentioned the Northeast Kingdom before, because this is a part of Vermont that leans very conservative, that is quite rural. Because it's not about who can turn out everyone everywhere, it's about who can turn out particular groups of people, those three categories of, of voters, in swing states. I think there's no doubt comparing uh, Bernie Sanders supporters uh, support in the Northeast Kingdom with Elizabeth Warren's less than average Democrat, kind of replacement level Democrat, um, you know, performance in Western Massachusetts, it's very obvious to me that Bernie Sanders is the strongest choice. Beyond that, we're not actually looking at a level playing field going ahead. We're at a point where Bernie Sanders is undisputably in the lead, but now he's facing a challenge from the right. We don't know what's going to happen in South Carolina. Maybe somehow the Biden campaign will be resurgent, but most likely his challenge will be from Bloomberg. If you're a committed progressive and you can contribute to supporting progressive ideas, I think that's all the more case to put some energy and time into canvassing, phone banking, and making calls right now for, um, for Bernie Sanders. And obviously, we do have to look towards a general election. We have to look towards a potential convention fight where forces will be arrayed against Bernie Sanders, mostly forces from the, from the uh, center right of the Democratic Party. And I think this is the strong case for uh, actually getting together and saying now that if we want, like what would it take to get Elizabeth Warren to endorse uh, a, a Bernie Sanders? I'm not saying Elizabeth Warren should drop out. What I am saying is that Elizabeth Warren supporters should think about uh, actually going out there and, and saying, what would it take for me to support Bernie Sanders to canvass for him? Because the next two months are going to be crucial. All right. Okay, so this is off the top of the dome. Let's go. Um, so, a few things. So in the, in the green room, we were talking about this, um, this notion that there are very discrete lanes in our politics, like there's a moderate lane and a, and a progressive lane, and people aren't lanes, right? And you know, I was door knocking in South Carolina and I was having a conversation with a woman in a barber shop who um, you know, was persuaded by my arguments and said, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'll probably vote for, uh, you know, your candidate, but, you know, I, there is common ground with Trump, like, you know, I do agree with the wall, for example, right? And so, our people are ideologically very mixed people, and simply because somebody endorses one candidate, one progressive candidate, doesn't mean that they'll fall in lockstep under the other one. 
which is why we need as many on-ramps as possible to progressive change. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about Elizabeth Warren. She's bringing in people who otherwise would have been on the sidelines, otherwise would not been in the fight. And she's, uh, she's providing an on-ramp to big, bold progressive change, to this idea that we have to transform our entire economy and our uh, entire democracy in order for us to achieve significant relief for our, our families. I think that that is one of the contributions that she's made on the ground. That's one of the contributions that she's made on the debate stage. And she, at a time that, you know, she had that amazing breakout perform performance in Nevada, she's raised more money um, in such a short period of time from small do dollar donations over the past few days. She's, in some polls, ranked number two under Bernie, and in terms of enthusiasm, uh, is ranking at 60%. Just under Bernie, Bernie's rank at 65%. That's showing that the two progressives in this race are building in a very, very exciting electoral movement that I think, as all progressives, we need to see run its course. Um, it's also, another thing I want to say about Elizabeth Warren is that that approach that focuses on people's race, class, and gender identity. That is creating a movement where people see themselves in the movement. Um, and I think it's really important in terms of on-ramps that we talk about public policy in a way that, that allows people to be more acquainted with, with each other. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why Elizabeth Warren, again, is providing a value on the debate stage, is providing a value um, in the grassroots organizing that she's doing around the country, and why it's important that she's building this movement in the states that she's operating in. Um, so Elizabeth Warren's candidacy is, again, like I said, I'm a movement person, a lot more than her victory. It's about building the durable movement and about transforming consciousness so that when we defeat Trump, when we defeat Trump, we will have millions of people ready for the next stage. Thank you. So I'm going to call the other two rebuttal speakers in a second. But I, I'm just going to seize the mic for a minute uh, to ask whether any of you, while you're talking, or we can do this later. I mean, I can ask moderator questions, too. But you know, there is that question mark in time to choose. And there's the question of delegate math. I mean, when you look at polls, uh, one of the, the, the number that leapt out at me after Nevada was the fact that together, Sanders and Warren were well over 50%. So the question is, or maybe a question you might want to consider, either in your rebuttals or going forward, is, you know, does it make sense for both candidates, how, regardless of how they're doing, to stay on to the end or not? And if not, why not? Uh, and if yes, yes. If you don't answer it now, I'll ask it again. But I, I thought it might be something you might want to consider in your rebuttals. So I have run for office, and I have a commitment to never asking anybody to drop out. I do think Michael Bloomberg should stop trying to buy elections and should switch parties. But, I, but there's some real urgency here, because we do have to defeat Donald Trump. And right now, the Bernie Sanders campaign and the trust that he has built across class and race, across every demographic. A new poll today shows him leading nationally among African Americans. He has been leading among Latino voters. He is leading under voters, uh, with voters, uh, he's leading across the board. And he's leading extraordinarily with voters under, under 45. But he is also leading Trump by the largest margin of any candidate, 7% in Michigan. He's leading Trump in Pennsylvania. <coughs> He's leading in Virginia, the swing state, with the largest margin of any candidate. He's outperforming every other Democratic candidate in Texas against Donald Trump. <laughs> And that is on top of polls showing Sanders beating Trump in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And these are not hypothetical polls. This is not an unvetted candidate. This is a candidate who people know. They know how he calls himself. Some people know all kinds of things about him that aren't true. <laughs> 
But this is one of the most well-known politicians in the country whose smears have been thrown at for four years, and he is outperforming Trump right now. And I do think it is urgent that we take this moment to join this campaign, do your door knocking, do your phone calling, because we must come together to beat Michael Bloomberg and to beat Donald Trump. The other thing, there is no more pro-worker candidate in recent American history than Bernie Sanders, and the working people of this country know that. The spectrum workers on strike in the longest strike in New York City know that because he calls them out, he stands on the picket line, and I ran for office in 2016, and I'll tell you, I had union supporters who were door knocking for me, but I know that they weren't necessarily supporting Democrats. He has deep, deep labor support, and when he is president, <laughs> President Sanders will be able to take the extraordinary trust and transform this country so we can have more equality. Even, as a, even right now, using his existing platform, he has pushed both Disney and Amazon and forced them to raise their wages for people who are working for Disney and Amazon. Now imagine what he can do when he's president. And I think uh, I'm going to pick it up from right where Zephyr ended because I think what we've seen on the campaign trail is how these candidates, including Elizabeth Warren, are winning victories for workers. So just in the last week, uh, she was part of a victory that forced Wells Fargo to return uh, billions of dollars back to people that they have defrauded. I think it was $3 billion. And also forced another employer to release at least three people from non-disclosure agreements that they had been bound to. So we know as long as she's out there, she's also going to keep fighting for workers and, and keep winning really concrete gains. Um, I want to answer Don's question. I'm going to do it uh, by citing prominent Bernie supporter Larry Cohen uh, about the importance of having both progressives continue to fight, continue to win delegates, approach the convention with a significant number of delegates. And there's really two reasons for that. First, it is very difficult. The math makes it very difficult for any one candidate to get a majority of the delegates on the first ballot. You know, that it didn't even happen in the last two cycles with only two candidates, much less with all these candidates. So the chance of having a first ballot progressive delegate majority is a whole lot better if both of these candidates succeed and have a significant number of delegates. There is a lot better chance that two of them together will have a majority than there is that only one of them would have a majority. And the second reason for that really gets at what Maurice was saying, you know, this idea of a progressive and a moderate lane as though if one of them would drop out and endorse the other, the vast majority of their supporters would move. It just doesn't look true, and it doesn't look true in either direction. It does not look true that if Bernie were to drop out and endorse Elizabeth Warren, that the vast majority of Bernie supporters would vote for her, and it doesn't look true that the vast majority, hopefully a majority in either direction, but with lots of leakage. And so that means in each of the remaining primaries and caucuses, we are better off with them both in the race. Now, I will answer uh, Bhaskar's question, because if, as I'm a del, I'm a proud Elizabeth Warren delegate, uh, please vote for her in the New York uh, primary. When we get to that convention, uh, I hope between the two of them, they have a majority of first ballot delegates. And if he is in the lead, then I'll be delighted to support him on that first ballot and make sure that he wins. I would ask the same in return when she has a dynamite Super Tuesday comeback and she is in the lead heading into the convention and between the two of them they have a majority that Bernie delegates would support her on the first ballot. That's how a progressive is going to win the convention, going to win the nomination, and we're all going to work our butts off for them in the general. Thank you. I think that's been terrific. Can we have a, a hand for our panelists at this point? Now, I had prepared, this was the, gonna be the oppo dump portion of the evening where you know, I was gonna ask the killer questions that they were too embarrassed to ask. No, I had prepared a question for each side and Brad, you've sort of answered part of it but I'm going to ask it anyway because I would like to hear Maurice answer it and also give you a chance to answer it more fully, which is 
those of us who were watching the last debate carefully will notice that when Elizabeth Warren was asked whether the candidate with the most votes uh, at the convention should be the nominee, she said something about letting the process take its course. You've suggested that your own personal view is that the candidate with the most votes, certainly between these two, uh, should be the nominee. But I, I, so I, I, I would like to ask the Warren supporters where you are on the, with the most votes comes to the convention, do they, should they be the nominee? Do they have a moral claim on the nomination? Sure, so in the scenario that um, Brad laid out, I think absolutely any, every progressive should align in that way. Now, Michael Bloomberg is inundating our process with hundreds of millions of dollars and he has unlimited spending. In the scenario where Michael Bloomberg successfully buys enough dele delegates to have a plurality, I'd like to think that we would not honor the nature of that bought plurality. And we as progressives have to use every tool at our disposal in order to prevent the buying of our democracy and that Bernie and Warren delegates will come together in order to make, make an intervention there. So I think we need to have as many tools at our disposal because this is still a very, very fluid race where we have an unlimited spender attempting to buy our democracy and buy delegates in order to specifically play a role of Kim Maker in that, in that brokered convention scenario. So in the scenario where it's a progressive, I think it's easy, but in a scenario where that person is Michael Bloomberg, um, I think we should be resisting Michael Bloomberg and his agenda at all costs. Um. So, I, you know, I, I, for all its flaws, I really believe in majoritarian democracy. And you have to win a majority. So I will say, like, I don't think the right answer is whatever candidate with the plurality who has the most votes but not a majority should be the nominee. Um, I wish we had ranked choice voting. That would solve this problem more effectively than this cockamamie system that we have. But given what the rules are, the best bet I think we have is for them both to do really well. I think between the two of them, they have a good chance of having a majority of progressive delegates on the first ballot before the superdelegates come in. And then yes, like whichever of the two of them is ahead, that's what we should do. Um, but I do think like, you gotta get to a majority that is a sound democratic principle. Does this work? Yes, good, so I don't have to get up again beginning to feel a little like a jack-in-the-box. Um, thank you. I think that does answer the question uh, pretty thoroughly. And uh, for the Sanders people, um, my question is, isn't Elizabeth Warren right that if we really want to enact an agenda for radical change, we need to do something about the filibuster? Well, yes, I think, I think the filibuster needs to be abolished. Um, I think that at, at various times, uh, Democrats of all stripes have saw the filibuster as just a defensive mechanism to prevent Republicans with a minority rule, which, which of course still gives them a majority because of how undemocratic our political system is, uh, from enacting and causing great harm onto working communities. Um, but I think in the long run, of course, the filibuster needs to be abolished, but fundamentally, the challenge at the moment and the great success of the Sanders campaign won't necessarily just be in writing policy, but in changing the conditions in which policy is written. You know, we've already had a candidate who ran on a public option uh, in 2008 and won, and we didn't get a public option. You know, I, so I think I, one of the, the, the things I like about Sanders is, again, this potential transformation, this uh, injection of new voters into, into the process, this broadening the base of politics. That's why I don't even like calling it, even though we're progressives and we're socialists, it's none of that. It's this broader egalitarian coalition that we're just tapping the, the tip of the iceberg on. But, uh, but of course, I'm, I'm against the filibuster and um, it would behoove, I think, uh, Sanders, once he's in power, to think about these structural mechanisms and what we could do to, to really transform some of the st structures that make America less democratic than it is today. So, uh, Zephyr, do you agree with Sanders on the filibuster or Warren? I think I largely agree with um, what was already said. I think that there's a kind of politics 
where we look for the one or two things where there's an area of disagreement. Like, I, I really like democracy uh, dollars, the democracy vouchers, uh, which Sanders supports and Warren hasn't come out. In front. And I think it's really important that Sanders support it. But I'll be honest with you, that policy difference is not the reason I am supporting Bernie Sanders. And I think we sometimes use um, areas of difference, and we just have to be honest with ourselves about like the real reasons. I support Bernie Sanders because I think we are in a transformational moment in American politics, and he has proven that he can build a cross-race, cross-class movement that can not only defeat Donald Trump, but radically change the power people have over their own lives, and too many people are suffering right now. I also believe he has the power, he, one of the things I think people miss about Sanders is how much the campaign is actually about um, loving each other and taking care of each other. And they, they may miss it, and especially elite pundits, because he's angry. And he's angry because there's people, billionaires and big corporations, who are responsible for the suffering but only once we understand the correct target, the real block of power in this country is, although I agree with you about some rule changes, the real block of power that we have in this country is big corporations and billionaires. That is the real block of power. And he has done more than anybody in this country in letting us know that we do not have to live in this inhumane, in uh, unequal system. And that's the real reason. I don't know, you know, none of us all agree on everything. That's not the point. Okay, thank you. Instead of asking another question of each side, I'm going to ask you all to uh, riff on or respond to something Maurice said. Because uh, I think we are in a unique moment here. We are in a moment where there's a democratic process uh, which is playing itself out, but which is being distorted by a kind of uh, black hole or whatever you want to call it of huge amounts of money being injected into the system. Uh, which att attracts media attention, it attracts hangers-on, you know, it attracts all sorts of fawning, it attracts uh, mainstream corporate support. So, Morris, what you said that struck me is you said we, we must do what we can to defeat Bloomberg at all costs. And I guess my question, and this is an open-ended question, I don't know my answer to it, but I'm really interested in your answer, is what do we do if Bloomberg buys the Democratic nomination? Well, well, I mean, I mean, I think, I think we'll we'll find out soon what what happens, and I'm I'm, I believe that that people will reject Michael Bloomberg and what he's what he's doing. I think he's going to win over a layer of, of of voters that are just tuning in, uh, but a lot of the voters who are watching Bloomberg ads and uh, kind of misleading ads and make it seem like he was endorsed by Obama. And are, are probably going to be less, are probably low propensity voters that are less likely to turn out. I hope they turn out, by the way. Uh, I think in the end, what he's going to do is prevent the consolidation around Biden. Uh, I think in, in a way, he might be playing a positive role, giving Sanders uh, a large polarity. And I think that's, that's the difference. I agree with you in principle that there's no democratic principle that says whoever gets a polarity should, should win. You know, if there was the, the first round of the French elections and the, the national front in a three-way race gets 32 percent um, and uh, like a left, center-left candidate gets 25 percent, you know, we don't just, you wouldn't, we wouldn't advocate for the national front to get the election in that case. But if Sanders has 42 percent, 43 percent, the nearest candidate has 29, 30, then I think you could say he has a, he has a mandate. But I, I, I may be wrong, but I, I am pretty optimistic that voters are going to reject uh, Bloomberg and that he doesn't have a viable path to winning and, and you can't completely buy an election That's the other thing we can't play the cynical game that say that voters are just children that are so easily manipulated because they're not um, And often when we on the left and the center left say that voters are easily manipulated We get to the trap where we're blaming everything on on Russia. We're blaming Brexit just on you know Cambridge Analytica You know we're, we're making all these claims that I think fundamentally diminish and cheapen democracy. And it plays into this idea that, that, oh, this doesn't really matter. There's no real democracy. It's all bought anyway. And even as we critique corporate power, we have to be careful not to play into that cynicism, which in the long run will only demobilize the people we need to turn out. Zephyr? I, 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 because I 
study corruption, and therefore Aristotle. I just have a brief thought about Michael Bloomberg and oligarchy. According to Aristotle, oligarchy is the selfish rule of the few. When we look at modern cases of oligarchy, people often look to places like Ukraine. And one of the defining features is that you have candidates for office who are deeply invested in a particular essential industry. They're not just rich accidentally, but have power because of their industrial power. And also, you have candidates who sponsor or engage or directly run for office, but their relationship to party is totally non-ideological. They, they'll switch parties. They'll sponsor one party one year and sponsor another party another year. And the absence of ideology is one thing that we look at as like, this is a real problem. This is somebody who's just, the, the party system isn't working. So all I want to say is we are not going to let an oligarch um, take over the Democratic Party. And I think a lot of us, that's worth clapping for. Um, a lot of us in the room who fought Bloomberg on so many things right here in New York City, we have a responsibility in the coming months to make sure people know there's been a lot of focus rightly on stop and frisk and on the non-disclosure agreements, but like, let's look at the list. He used the NYPD to surveil Muslim students associations and mosques and like turn it into a spying force on innocent people uh, because of their religion. He required people to be fingerprinted to get food stamps. He made it harder if you're in a homeless shelter to get a subsidy to get into permanent housing because he thought otherwise people would like flock to the homeless shelters. And then he even made it harder to get into the homeless shelters, telling people like, you're not really homeless, go back to your sister's couch or your abuser's apartment. He used the NYPD to crack down on Occupy and, a com and, and on the RNC. You know, like we've got a long list here of things that we need to remind Americans uh, this Democrats, this oligarch is not a Democrat. We cannot let him lead our party. And I think, you, you know, one thing that happened on the debate stage, obviously part of what happened that was Elizabeth was brilliant, but he is uncomfortable. But a second thing that happened is that he's uncomfortable because he's trying to run as a person he's not. You know, like he really believed all those things he did when he was here. He defended them to the hilt. He thought was that was the right way to govern. He still thinks that's the right way to govern. And you can, in ads, present a different persona than the one you have, but it's very hard to get up on stage and pretend to be someone that you're not. And I think the more we can keep the heat coming, the harder it will be for him to persuade voters to vote for him, and then we won't have to confront this problem because he won't be the nominee. And, and just, just, just for Tonight he is skipping a, he's skipping a town hall. I think the reason's obvious. He doesn't want more exposure where he actually has to show who he is. So, yeah, I'll, the only thing I'll add is the, the thing that to me is more shocking than Donald Trump's bombastic demagoguery, and that form of racism is Michael Bloomberg's sober racism, all right? And, yeah, you could. Now, I largely agree that as organizers and as people who are interested in building um, a exciting and positive uh, movement, we can't fall into cynicism. At the same time, we can't be seduced by American exceptionalism and think that somehow our democracy is impervious to all of the things that have allowed democracies to fall to oligarchs. And if we take that seriously, then, then I feel some level of optimism that Michael Bloomberg won't buy our democracy, right? We can't be passive about it. We need to be active and engaged in order to make sure and ensure that it doesn't happen. Okay, so now is the time for audience questions. There are microphones here and here. Uh, if there's something you'd like to ask, please stand 
at a microphone. I'll call on you. Uh, and then if you're directing your question to any one specific person on the stage, please say who you're directing it to. And before you say anything else, please say who you are. Uh, and as I said before, please keep your questions questions and keep them short, because if you keep them long, I'm going to cut you off. Um, Ma'am, why don't you go first? OK. Can you hear me? We, just about. Maybe a little louder. Just hold the mic real close. That's OK. Perfect. Uh, I think we are extraordinarily blessed to have this choice. And it's uh, unimaginable. Uh, but it's very good to imagine it. Um, my, one of my concerns is that if Elizabeth were to drop out, then Bernie is alone in all these debates against all these corporate shills. So I would uh, like to, um, I guess, plead, plead that both candidates stay in the race. So can I, can I rephrase your question as for the, we assume that the Warren people want Elizabeth Warren to stay in. So, so can I rephrase it? And we want Bernie Sanders for, to stay in for, as well. For the, We're not can for I him rephrase dropping it out so either. You, you, you want to know whether the Sanders people also would like to have Elizabeth Warren stay in? I mean, you've got to ask a question. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Is, uh, uh, Go I, I got to just tell you, Bernie Sanders is an amazing, consistent, strong debater. And he has been his entire career. And in fact, when, when I ran for Congress, I had a communications uh, expert who I think is not, um, uh, doesn't have a candidate this time, who made me watch Bernie Sanders on Fox News over and over. <laughs> <laughs> because and it's, a, it's a serious point, not just about debate, but about all the different environments in which we see candidates. But you're talking about a hostile environment. Um, is that he has a really, really astounding ability to answer the real question that people want to have answered and to refocus about the real issues that are affecting people's lives. And the reason he was successful winning as a, a Democratic Socialist in Vermont when Vermont was winning, when, uh, when Republicans were winning, and the reason he has been so successful is that extreme focus. And that will matter for debates in the primary, but it will also really matter with the uh, distraction efforts of Donald Trump um, uh, in the summer and fall. Vascar, do you want to? No, I think that's great. I, I'm I'm like the Garfunkel of this. I, I know I know my role. That was, that's way better than I could do. Does that mean that you have a actually much better singing voice than Zephyr? I'm not sure. It's... What 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 I what I want to ask is, I think they have been admirable in the way in which they have not attacked each other, but they are getting to the point in which they are taking some of the bait to say, well, I'm better, and. I would like to know whether that strategy of protecting each other and not attacking each other is likely to go forward. Do you want to, does, does anybody want to speak to that? I, so I think, it's, I think it's actually really critical that um, both of them continue to point their fire towards the, the third way candidates on, on the debate stage. And I think drawing, Drawing distinctions that are, that are solid on the merits, it's fine, right? Like, we talked about differences that they have, like real policy differences that I think it's important for voters to understand. But I think, um, I think we need to see more of both of, them, both of them on the debate stage, her continuing to hit Bloomberg like a pinata, and also really challenge, you know, challenge on the substance um, the reason why the sort of third way corporate democratic strategy has been discredited. I think that that, that absolutely, I would agree with you, should continue to happen. Okay, I, wanna, I wanna get a lot of questions in, so I'm gonna go to this gentleman here. Please say your name first. My name is Char Charles Olson. I'm wondering, I haven't heard the candidates speak much about this, and I, I confess I have not read um, policy papers, but I'm wondering um, if there are positions, or even if as, as representatives you would 
clarify or care to misstate your own opinion regarding America's largest social welfare program, which is war spending. And if there's any, if there's been any um, statements or thoughts about uh, any way we can possibly unwind some of this. Thank you. We'll just go left to right, but quickly, please. Yeah, I mean, as Sanders has, has discussed cutting the, the defense uh, budget, and I think most importantly um, has been a clear and consistent um, opponent of uh, foreign uh, wars. And beyond that, um, you know, I would like to see a candidate in the future talk about uh, particularly dismantling um, more U.S. bases abroad and, and other things that, that I think have a very negative effect, both destabilizing countries around the world and also split, uh, spending uh, U.S. you know treasure abroad. But I think Sanders has been pretty consistent as the clearest uh, anti-war uh, voice in, in uh, the race. I'm going to skip to the, unless you definitely want to leap in, Zephyr, I'm going to skip to the other side on that. So yeah. we, we have like one... One answer per side, then we'll sure. get more questions in. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren has been on, on the record, both in her anti-corruption stances, which actually goes at the heart of the military-industrial complex, but also, specifically, she's, she's drawn a line against forever wars. Um, and I think, you know, what's, what's also true, if we're to be honest, is that both Democratic and, Re and Republican presidents have been part of a consensus on U.S. empire from ages. And we're finally seeing for the first time, a, a bit of a challenging of that consensus. And this is where, this is very important, where social movements and grassroots movements need to play our position, because honestly, even, even the two progressive candidates in the race, uh, we could not honestly call them anti-imperialist, right? So there's work to be done, and that's the role of social movements. I think you call Sanders an anti-imperialist. I mean, there's a reason why he's getting attacked in the right-wing media now for a stance in solidarity with the struggles in Central America. Um, and, and particularly his, his history throughout the 70s and 80s in solidarity with, with uh, oppressed people throughout the Americas. And I think it's true that they, that's absolutely true, and it's also true that they, there are, they, have, they have mixed both records in terms of their statements and votes on key questions around that, and they are historically the best presidential candidates on foreign policy from, the, from a left perspective. So this, could, this could run for a while, and maybe we'll have another foreign policy debate, but I want to go to the person over there. Okay. Uh, Would you say your name first, my please? Na my name is Marion Lipschitz. Uh, my question is primarily for Mr. Sankara. And I have to say that as a feminist and a democratic socialist who has supported Elizabeth Warren from the beginning, I feel sad that I have to ask you this question, but in good question, in conscience, I have to ask you. You claim to see women as an equal part of the working class and an equal part of Bernie Sanders' political revolution, but your publication... I'm pub sorry, but you've got to come to a question. Yes. Okay. Your publication published an article in which a male author condescendingly referred to Elizabeth Warren's outstanding expertise in the federal regulatory process as evidence of her being a neoliberal technocrat. How does that sit with you, Mr. Sankara? And why should I believe that you're sincere in an intersectional approach? Well, I don't believe your question in part because the word neoliberal has never been used in Jacobin. As far as I can tell, you guys can go on your phone. Maybe it was used in passing once. Um, I don't think technocrat is a slur. Um, uh, and we have a lot of writers, and I'm not particularly sure of the context of that piece. Even if I knew the context of the piece and disagreed with it, I don't think it would be my role as a publisher to you know, throw a writer under the, the bus. I think there is no doubt that, that um, most of the writers of Jacobin, most of the activists in DSA uh, support um, Bernie Sanders, uh, in part not because we think that these alternative approaches to tackling uh, oppression are not important, uh, but in fact, because we think the most substantial way to attack oppression is broad redistributive programs that will uh, take power and wealth and give it to the most oppressed people. I think Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren fight for many of the same progressive cause, causes. I think there's a clarity, a moral clarity to Bernie Sanders' support. And also, if you look at his coalition, if you look at his base, we, t we hear a lot about the Elizabeth Warren approach to oppression and marginalized community, about how she's building bridges between communities of color, uh, between um, 
you know, reaching out to marginalized groups and so on and so on. Bernie Sanders is the one with the actual base that encompasses marginalized groups. He's the one who's actually winning the votes of marginalized groups. So I, 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 again, I, I think that we just have to look at the numbers, we have to look at the base, we have to look at the, the backing. But uh, you know, of, of course I think Elizabeth Warren has been, um, has, has been the, the victim of, of sexist attacks. And of course I think that fighting all forms of oppression, uh, particularly fighting sexism is of utmost importance to the left. And I think we should assume that as an article of good faith uh, between Warren and Sanders supporters. So we're both committed to many of the same ends. Okay, I'm gonna go to this gentleman. Please say your name and your question. Yeah, my name is Chris. I wonder if you would agree that if Sanders gets a nomination, he would be at a disadvantage in a general election vis-a-vis -vis Warren simply because he's more associated in public mind with the term socialism, a scare word, than she seems to be. So do, do we think that socialism is a disadvantage, panel? Zephyr, do you want to take that since the, the we know what Baskar is, thinks? The question is whether Bernie Sanders would be at a disadvantage, and the answer is we have polling, he's winning, he's doing the best, and people know that he identifies as a democratic socialist. In fact, a lot of people think he identifies as a socialist. No, so, I'm asking about in the general election oh, between yeah. the two of them. He is more identified with the term social no, 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 the, than she is. Oh, right. And so what I was telling you is all that, sorry, if I wasn't clear before, that the uh, poll numbers that I was giving you yeah. are all current poll numbers where people know how he's identified and he is consistently outperforming Trump more than all the other candidates and also more than Elizabeth Warren in those, in those cases. So actually one of the things that I think is really important is that there that the thing that people think is his biggest weakness is the thing that people absolutely already know about. And with that existing knowledge, he is absolutely outperforming uh, Donald Trump. And it's because this people don't go by labels, they go by what you can do, what you stand for, what your values are, and who you're gonna fight for. <laughs> Do either of you want to jump in on that? Well, Vilify say, socialism or, you know? I'll just say two things here. You know, uh, like Bernie Sanders, I, I went to the University of Chicago and I joined the U of C Democratic Socialists of America chapter as a freshman there in the fall of 1991. Not quite as early as Bernie, obviously. So, I, I mean, I do think it is valuable for us to work hard to help a broader set of people, whether you're a Warren supporter or a Sanders supporter, come to see democratic socialism as something that we want to be part of the American context and debate. But I will say the following. The polling that I look at, I don't know if people are looking at like uh, Rachel Bittekoffer is having this like polling bubble. Honestly, right now, the country is so polarized that pretty much any Democrat is going to do about the same against Donald Trump. And that is, I think, a defense against this particular worry, but I think it would work very well for Elizabeth Warren. And what I really think it means is that it is going to be on all of us to like work our butts off in the general election. The margin is very slim and narrow. And truthfully, like the Democrat who wins the election, who we hope will not be Michael Bloomberg, and we hope will be one of these two candidates, but in any case, for the Senate and for the White House, what we've got is a, a lot of work to do to win a pretty narrow number of people to both get them to the polls and, and persuade the small number of persuadable voters. And I don't actually think that matters in, in, a, in a sad way, really, all that much who the candidate even Sir? is. Sir? Hi there, my name is Anton and I'm a small business owner. Uh, my question is for both sides. Um, a lot of the people within my entrepreneur uh, community um, are quite frankly kind of terrified of both candidates. <laughs> Um, and the sort of American exceptionalism that you spoke of, uh, the sort of rise of these oligarchs is sort of like a shift of, you know, well, we're all gonna become millionaires, so let's vote for um, these other millionaires who are gonna help us do that, right? Um, so my question to you guys is uh, what sort of, what can I bring to the table? What are great ways for me to engage within my peers? Because there's a lot of apathy that has gone on in terms of, agreeing with liberals uh, overall, their value system, but then like secretly voting for Trump or, or what? Great question, and again, one answer from each side, please. Okay, because this is like my heart. I mean, I care about this so much. <laughs> um, so we are, as your friends may know, in a 28-year decline in um, uh, small businesses in America. Startups in the US are radically down compared to in Europe. And there's a few key reasons that are core to Bernie Sanders' agenda. One, 
is we need Medicare for all because it gives people the freedom they need to be able to start businesses, switch businesses, not make choices dependent on like just hanging on for the not so great employer-based healthcare they have. And the second, and when I, I, I was just campaigning with uh, Bernie Sanders in New Hampshire, and he talks about that freedom all the time, and he knows that from his experience as a mayor in Burlington. He worked so well with the small business community there. And second, corporate monopolies are killing small businesses in America, and Bernie Sanders has the best anti-monopoly plan. It's fantastic. It was part of his uh, uh, announcement speech. I encourage you to t uh, check it out. It's about building up worker power and taking on um, uh, corporate power so that we also have room for the great flourishing of, of you and your colleagues. <laughs> Um, so this might actually be one of the places where we might really disagree a little, uh, because I think for folks who are thinking about small businesses and the flourishing of entrepreneurialism in the marketplace, Elizabeth Warren is the better candidate. Like when she talks about why unrigged markets um, matter to her in a pretty deep way, it is because she thinks that the kind of competition that can take place when there genuinely is a level playing field, when monopolies are broken up, um, uh, and when the rules aren't being rigged is beautiful. Like, she's really into it. And I think you can see the two of them talk about it in different ways. They don't have substantially different points of view on ending the uh, big tech monopolies and other monopolies. They would both focus strongly on antitrust. But I think if you want a candidate who's excited about what's possible for small entrepreneurs, for that kind of flourishing of creativity through the market when the rules aren't rigged, you'd be hard pressed to ever find like a, you know, maybe go back a hundred years to trust busting, but in the last century, you'd be hard to find a candidate who felt that way more deeply and built a policy around it more strongly than Elizabeth Warren. The gentleman on my right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is William Hanish. I'd like to ex um, extend further that very first question that was asked. I, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't personally feel it was answered adequately. Um, and I don't, I don't want, I think, you know, we can't speak in a vacuum. Um, uh, right now, Bernie Sanders is clearly the, the, the you know, the front, the, the leader, the, right? Overwhelmingly. Elizabeth Warren finished uh, uh, third, in, right, distant third in get Iowa. Get to the question, because okay. we're running out of time. The, the, the question is, at this debate, people are gonna uh, really gang up on Bernie Sanders right now. You know, that all, they all will, and the question is, will Elizabeth Warren also gang up on, on him because he has like accused him you know, of being responsible for his Twitter you know, following and stuff like that. Would it disappoint you if she joins the fray and, and, and joins Amy and Pete and, and, and Bloomberg and, and uh, Biden and gang up on Bernie Sanders tomorrow night? Okay, I think that's a, that's a pretty clear question. And uh, Warren supporters? Sure. So. Uh, Number one, and I, I answered this, I think I answered this directly, I think it's actually okay for both Bernie and, and Elizabeth Warren to draw distinctions between both of them that are on the issues, right? Um, number two, I think it, it is problematic for progressives to be advancing third way sort of strategies, and I think that both of them flanking each other on the debate stage as they've been doing for months and months is a good thing for our movement. And I both hope it continues and I think it's strategic for both of them for it to continue. Okay. So it'll disappoint you if she does. I, he, yeah. I think well, that you're... was a very clear answer. <laughs> Ma'am, ma ma we're, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What I'm gonna, I'm gonna change things a little bit because I wanna get a lot, as many more questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna donate a little of my closing time, but in return, what I want is two people on each side to ask your questions and then we're gonna have them all answered at once. So two, you two and you two, and then I'm afraid if you're beyond the second person in line, you might as well sit down, because we're, we're running out of time. So what's your question, please, okay. ma'am? Lynn Ritchie, um, I'm, I'm really afraid of what's gonna happen. Uh, you've gotta to get to the questions okay. quickly, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, um, yeah. uh, okay, Bernie's elected president, Elizabeth Warren's, or Elizabeth Warren's elected president. The Senate is not a um, democratic Senate. There's an inequality. Nothing gets done. How can we bring the Senate along? Okay, so the, the question of how do you handle the Senate, sir? 
Your question, please. Um, I, Yours, right. yeah. Yes, yeah, just a quick question for Maurice. Um, the Working Families Party with Doris and Warren, um, they, you decided to split your vote between both the board members and also the rank and file voters, but you didn't release what the rank and file voters um, voted on I mean, in terms of the I'm rank sorry, and file voters. So I, I, I why, understand um, your question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rule it out because it, we're not getting into process questions here. We're getting into questions for Sanders or Warren. Well, that's, that's part of the process in terms of how can we galvanize in terms of organizations and unions without <laughs> full transparency. All right, well, what I'm going to do is, you've asked your question, which is about the process that they made their endorsement. Okay. No I'll let Maurice, I will let Maurice answer it should he wants to, but I'm also going to take one more question from this side, and then we're going to take two questions from this side. <clears throat> Richard Barr is my name. Uh, economic sanctions, crippling economic sanctions against countries is economic warfare. I've heard Bernie Sanders fairly clearly articulate opposition to that kind of policy. I have not heard Elizabeth Warren. Okay, so the candidate as, position on economic sanctions. Thank you. I Good believe question. I heard her say she was in favor of it with Venezuela, and that troubled me. Okay, thank you. Sir. Uh, Paul Fiandello, this has to do with electability. One question for the Sanders side. Bernie 78, how do you explain his inability to attract the voters over the age of 65? <laughs> Second question, this is for the Warren uh, group. Um, your candidate squared off against three more moderate candidates in the last debate, all of whom seem to believe in some form of incrementalism, which, after all, was what Hillary Clinton believed in, and she won the 2016 nomination. So how does your candidate really convince these people that a more progressive, activist, uh, change-oriented approach can actually succeed. Okay, Thank so that's one question for each side, but it's one question. Sir, you're the last questioner. Ricky Oliver, <clears throat> my question is about the idea of universality. Uh, I just want to know your thoughts on uh, whether you should, uh, for example, for the uh, for relieving student debt, whether that should be limited to uh, people of a certain income versus uh, uh, for everybody, basically. Okay, thank you. I'm a new school student, and I would really like to... I'm sorry, but we've got to draw the line somewhere. I said two from each side. I have a All right, wait a minute. Question. Stop. I have a quick question, Just please. stop. Wait, before you ask your question. Audience, One more. show of hands. Shall I ask? Shall I let her ask a question? Okay, that's it. You're the last questioner. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. My quick question is... There are more women than men in the United States of America. Why, this is for everyone, but I'm sort of speaking to the Bernie people. Isn't it time that we have a woman be the nominee and the president of the United okay. States? Thank you. Now we're going to, questions. Um, Maurice, do you want to speak to the process question first? No, that was it. That was, that was three. That, I'm, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm really so. I'm sorry, but you're going to have to sit down. And if you don't sit down, I'm going to have to get you to sit down. In the Muslim ban. Thank you. I think, okay. I think thank you. I think that's a, that's a vital concern, and perhaps we can address okay. it either now or yeah. in your yeah. in let me, closing let me remarks. Take the, let me take, let me take that up. I, I stand corrected. Thank you for raising it. Great, thank okay. you. So let me take the process question, and I'm, thank you that you asked it. Any venue that I get to engage this question. I, I really appreciate it. So um, there's, you know, we knew that when we endorsed and also when we endorsed as early as we did that it would be controversial wherever we landed. Um, we thought it was essential that we endorse because the stakes of the, of the nature of the race. Um, now, there's been this sort of uh, characterization of our grassroots members in a way that just isn't isn't accurate. So we're in New York State, for example, where we have hundreds of grassroots rank and file union members and rank and file members of organizations like Make the Road New York and NYCC that make up our state committee. And they engage in rigorous debate on all types of questions, including particularly this question of the, uh, the presidential nomination. Those are the people that have been disparaged online and in other uh, venues as being somehow our board. These are our members, our grassroots members, many of which are working class people of color all throughout New York State, all throughout West Virginia, all throughout Chicago, all throughout Colorado. They 
were generous and they understood that we are a movement and they opened up their vote to our online members who exist all over the place, including places where we aren't building and going hard in the paint every day to build the internal democracies throughout the country that make up the Working Families Party. We felt it was essential that these two halves of a whole are together and that they're indistinguished. And I think the underlying suggestion is that the online vote is somehow more legitimate and needs to be broken out. And we were very, very clear that all of our members are our members and our vote is our vote. And that was an internal consideration of our organization's internal democracy that we struggled with over months. And I think it's important that whatever the outcome, and we understand that people are disappointed in the outcome, and we have very strong Bernie forces and strong Warren forces still within our party, that we honor organizations, left organizations, left organizations run by black people and people of color. We honor their internal democracies. Thank you for the question. Um, okay. And um, Brad, you want to go next? Uh, sure. And I actually just want to start by underlining that and urge like a lot of generosity of spirit and membership and contribution to the Working Families Party. It's hard to build a progressive political force that has activists and labor unions and community organizations in it in a coalition format, but it's the only way we're going to be able to build the power we need. What it has delivered and made possible in New York um, on so many issues, on the fight for 15, on stop and frisk, on paid sick days, helping us build a coalition in the council, kill it, knocking out the IDC, it's remarkable. And I just, I think, uh, I feel lucky for Maurice's leadership. They've got a great new New York state director, Sochi Nanameka, um, and I would just urge people to like, this generosity of, of spirit and solidarity we've been showing here tonight, I, I think the party's critical for. Uh, yes, she'll repeal the Muslim ban and her plan to uh, fight white nationalism is worth reading. Yes, obviously we must put energy into the Senate and it is hard to stay focused on because presidential politics take up all of our attention and Donald Trump is good at distracting and taking away our attention and in addition to working hard in the presidential race, we must, I'm proud Elizabeth Warren has raised money and put it into fighting to take back the Senate um, and you know, uh, I'm proud to be a supporter along with Adi Barkin whose uh, clever uh, way of raising money to defeat Susan Collins has put millions of dollars in the hands of our main candidate and that is work we have the responsibility to do. And I guess I'll just maybe say one more word about that kind of you know, uh, visionary gradualism like what distinguishes incrementalism, which are steps you take and then like the compromises are such that you feel deflated and you go home and you haven't built more power. And the difference is what's it look like to have a plan where you take a step that enables more people to believe the next step is possible. That's why I actually think the idea of doing uh, a Medicare for all plan that starts with a public option but continues to focus on fighting corruption and sets the bar of saying, here's why we've got to move to single payer, here's why we reduce costs that way. Like, that's the model. And will it work to convince moderates on the one hand that the next step is worth taking? And will it work on the other hand to persuade people who see the long-term vision that it's worth taking that step? Like that's what movement building work is. And whatever you think about these two candidates and whichever way you think the best way is to get to Medicare for all, that's the work our movements have to do. So, so just, just really quickly, um, I think it's worth noting that Sanders' vision of change you know, is incremental. You know, this is a candidate who's voted for, for example, Obamacare, even when it didn't have the public option. He's someone who's never uh, said no to a progressive gain. He's someone who showed a willingness to work with Republicans. He showed a willingness to, to speak um, uh, to people he disagrees with. Uh, so I think the vision of Sanders as a wild-eyed radical is a myth both propagated on the left by people in, in my camp, and it's a myth propagated on the right. But I, th I think Sanders is, is an incremental um, uh, candidate. On the question of, of electing women, of course, um, it, it's about time we, we elected a woman, but, but the question is, uh, what's, what's the ideology, what's the program, what's the, 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 the reason? I think nothing can be more condescending than to just say, I'm going to vote for any woman for any reason just because she's a woman. And, and, um, 
Okay, well, I, 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 and I think that a candidate like Elizabeth Warren would not, is not running on, on, on just that. She's running on her ideas, she's running on her, her, her program. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why I, as a leftist, prefer, and we've been talking about this for an hour and a half, prefer um, uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, I'd be happy to vote for a, a woman running on Bernie Sanders' program. Uh, I've voted for Zephyr before. I'd be happy to vote for Zephyr as for, <laughs> uh, for president uh, one day. You know, I could dream. One could dream. Zephyr for president, and then, and definitely. Finally, um, and, 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 fi and, and finally... That might be the um, winner of the debate. Actually, I'm not completely... Uh, actually, this will just attract more anger, but I've only voted for, for, for women for president. And, um, <laughs> um, seriously. Uh, Cynthia McKinney and two Jill Steins. Um, I, I live in New York, though, so don't get too angry. Um, <laughs> and, and finally, just briefly on the question of the Senate, well, either candidate's going to have to figure out creative ways to use executive uh, orders than to get a bunch of smart lawyers to back up those executive orders. Um, but what I like about Sanders, I think he'll be able to use the bully pulpit of the, the presidency to say that your president wants you to form a union, your president is calling out the oligarchs, your president wants you to, to, to change again, the conditions in which uh, these 100 people are voting in the, in the Senate. And that's just the beginning. Um, but, but that, combined with just simply the defensive posture, we need to keep the right out. Uh, this is the reason why, barring Michael Bloomberg, if I was in the swing state, I would vote for any Democrat, because sometimes the defensive gain of keeping the right out is, is half the battle. Okay. So just when I know, what just talk. They'll, they'll we, I know up. we have very little uh, time, so I just want to address the question about um, the electability question about uh, older voters, um, because it's an important one. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, whatever those reasons are, we saw them change in Nevada. We saw Bernie Sanders winning across age groups in Nevada. It's really important. Um, but second, I think it, it's something that I encounter in my own life regularly, is that I, I'll meet older voters who deeply agree, older progressives who deeply, deeply agree with what Bernie Sanders stands for. But they don't dare hope that it is possible that a candidate like that can win. And there's a level of heartbreak and learned helplessness, like a trying to guess what is electable elsewhere. And second, he is presenting a very different model of politics. And it is a better model of politics. But we have had, since, 19, since Ronald Reagan, <laughs> we have had, uh, Democrats have been on the defensive for so long that it's hard for Democrats to believe that we can be on the offensive. And I believe the way to win is by being on the offensive, is by putting out this moral vision. But when it, comes, when it comes to a general election, it's a whole different ballgame. Because in a general election, you have Donald Trump uh, stripping Social Security benefits, and you have Bernie Sanders who is pushing to expand Social Security and has been standing for a strong Social Security his entire career. And so the contrast will be incredibly clear. And I feel very confident about President Sanders getting the votes across different age uh, categories. Thank you. And, and thank all of you for coming and for asking great questions, for forcing me to change the rules for a good cause. Uh, I don't think there's anybody on this stage who represents a candidate who doesn't feel that lifting the Muslim ban ought to be something done in the first 100 hours, let alone the first 100 days. But we should, we should say that. We should hold them to it. Um, and I want to say something about something Zephyr said, which is about heartbreak and daring to hope. Because I think there is, there is something radical about hope that we need to discover now. And I think both of these campaigns, in different ways, have tapped into it. And that's what's been so exciting to be a, for me to be a political journalist, and I think for all of us to be political participants in this time, is that it's suddenly become OK to hope for things that we'd been told for generations weren't possible, that we, were, that we were told were fringe ideas, like the idea that you should be able to go to college not based on how much money your parents had, or the idea that you should be able to see a doctor and not worry about whether you'll be able to feed your kids tomorrow, 
or the idea that you could be a woman and be president and not have to suck up to corporations to do it. I think, you know, to me, the most radical thing about both of these campaigns is the way they raise their money. And I think they, they deserve our thanks for that and for showing it's possible to raise money without sucking up to corporations. So I think we've seen some differences. Uh, I hope if you were on the fence, it was useful to you. Uh, oh yeah, you're gonna have some closing. I'm sorry, I'm doing my closing before your closing. So I apologize. You guys, you do your closing, and then I'll thank you all, and I, I will be really. Thank you so much for, again for, for coming and for, for uh, you know, taking, taking seriously the debate. Uh, the amount of people speaking and lining up to speak per audience is, was you know, very impressive. So obviously people feel very passionate about this. So I, I must say, if you're a progressive, if you're a leftist, if you're a nation reader, if you're a nation editor, writer, whatever, congratulations because this is your moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for a presidential candidate who espouses our core beliefs among left liberals is the front runner for the Democratic nomination. A presidential candidate who, by the way, one of the first things he did when he was thinking about running for president in 2016 was to speak to the nation. That's something that doesn't happen so often. That's something that re that's a result not just of one person, but of years of organizing. Now, when we think of Bernie Sanders, we should think about the people who first brought him in to Yipsel in the 1960s, who engaged with him throughout the 1960s in his civil rights organizing and his labor organizing. We should think about the people who convinced him to run for the Liberty Union Party in the 1970s and the 1980s. But then we should think about what Bernie Sanders managed to do for himself. How he managed to take his leftist training and his core moral commitments against oppression and against exploitation and turn it into a broad-based popular program. To turn it into a narrative that's attracted the support of a majority of Americans. In head-to-head -head polling, Bernie Sanders is beating Donald Trump. The message of the American left, taken into a popular vernacular, is beating Bernie Sanders. I don't think Bernie Sanders needs to be pressured by the left. I think he embodies much of the left. And I think he embodies a new way to talk about politics and a coming social democratic majority that will not just govern for the next eight years, will govern for the next 16 years, the next 20 years, and be able to finally transform the United States into the country that it should be. Thank you. It really has been a, an honor to do this, and I really appreciate all the questions and all the pushing. I think we're doing what we set out to, of like highlighting the arguments for each candidate, but building something stronger uh, and longer. I'm gonna let Maurice give our broader close, um, but I wanna conclude by talking a minute about why I do think supporting Elizabeth Warren is a feminist thing to do. Um, and that's not to say Bernie and his supporters and Bhaskar and Zephyr aren't strong feminists. I've seen them on the front lines. I've seen Bernie on the front lines of these issues. But I do think it is a moment to like step up and look honestly at this question. And if you're a Warren supporter, feel really proud about it. And if you're not, ask some hard questions about what it says about our country. Because if there's a very strong argument that she's the smartest of the candidates, the best prepared, the most able to do the concrete work of winning big structural change, but people People are reluctant to support her because they're afraid that other people won't vote for a woman or they don't like her style or afraid they'll be turned off by it. Like, there is a way in which we just got to be honest. That is yielding to misogyny. It is saying to our daughters, and, and you might think it was necessary, but it is a form of saying to our daughters, yes, 
We know you're second-class citizens of our country, but we just have more important things to deal with right now. Um, and we at least have to grapple with the price of saying that. Now look, electing Elizabeth Warren, President of the United States, will not eliminate structural sexism any more than electing Barack Obama eliminated racism. But representation matters. And after having 45 men as president, including some real pieces of work, um, <laughs> electing Elizabeth Warren as the first woman president would be one way of communicating to our daughters that we actually really think that women are fully equal human beings. Um, and there would be something really powerful to it. And I would urge you to read the piece in this morning's Nation by Susanna Denuta Walter on the connections between Warren's feminism and her intersectionality, the way that the race and class dimensions of the repeal of Roe, that she sees that and talks about it and lifts it up, the ways that the stories she's told about Phyllis Wheatley and the washerwomen and shirtwaist workers and the uprising of the 20,000 are critical lessons for the country at this moment in time. And I just think if you are a Warren supporter, feeling the power of intersectional feminism and what it can mean for our country if we really lean into it is extremely powerful. And if you are not a Warren supporter, then it is an important moment to say, what are we going to do to build a country that will elect the first woman as president of the United States? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Thank you for a, a great discussion. Um, I support Bernie Sanders because he is the most strong pro-worker candidate. He has been pro-worker all his life. And as President Sanders, he is going to lift up the voices of workers and we are gonna have a new moment for unionization in this country. I support Bernie Sanders because he is an unapologetic advocate for the Green New Deal, for the good union jobs, that means, and is honest about the crisis of the environmental threat. I support Bernie Sanders because he's a pro-peace candidate who stood up when it was hard against the Iraq War and organized to fight against the Iraq War. And, and in this most recent crisis moment, showed extraordinary leadership about what he will be like in dealing with other countries. His leadership after the, uh, after the strike was extraordinary. But I also support Bernie Sanders because he represents a politics of love and compassion. And I had a good friend, who, a friend that I knew through sports, who um, uh, found out, learned, got a phone call that his daughter was being um, sexually abused. And he wanted to, uh, go kill the person who did it. He wanted to go beat him up. Or the person who he thought did it. And I and my friends were with him that weekend and we did not know what to do. We were looking online, like what are the sources? Because he clearly, this was the wrong thing to do. He's an uh, Iraq war vet. Uh, he himself had a really rough childhood. I was like calling random hotlines. But somebody showed up for him somebody that he knew, a Vietnam War vet, through group counseling at the VA, and took him to his house and talked to him about why he needed to not do that, why he needed to be there for his daughter. And I mention that because that is a story about the VA, and there is no stronger supporter of veterans than Bernie Sanders, and that is why he has so much support among veterans. I also tell you as a story for why we need universal health care and why mental care is health care. <laughs> if he did not have access through, to that group counseling service through the VA, who would he have turned to? But finally, I tell you that as a Bernie Sanders story because it is a story about fighting for somebody who comes from a different background and a different time and taking care of each other. And I wanna live in a country where we take care of people who are at different ages, come from different backgrounds, where we fight for people that we don't know. And I see that moment of a new presidency and a moment of caring for others being the heart of the Bernie Sanders presidency. Thank you.
Okay, well, you, you, oh, no. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just champing at the bit here. Where, where's the dude that was talking about doing silent black voices now? <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> um, all right. So as we close out what's been a night of spirited debate, I want to take a moment to fully take in what's happening. A few election cycles ago, we'd have been in a room like this figuring out how to push a milk toast moderate candidate and how to enact a sliver of our agenda. In the last four years, we've moved the Overton window in significant ways, with even moderate candidates on board with proposals like a $15 minimum wage. But get this, today we have two progressive candidates that are responsive to the needs of the movement we've built and are putting working families, immigrants, people of color, and other marginalized people at the heart of their policy. And according to the latest CBS poll, they're the two most popular candidates in the field today. The Working Families Party was proud to endorse Elizabeth Warren for president and is proud to throw down and help her get elected. If I can say one more great thing about her, it's that she knows how to navigate when the waters get choppy. She built the CFPB when all the forces of Wall Street were arrayed against her. She defeated a popular incumbent to win her Senate seat. She even got a bill on hearing aids through Republican Senate past Donald Trump. Senator Warren knows how to push and pull the levers of power on the inside and has proven on many occasions to be responsive and accountable to the people impacted on the outside. We know that all candidates will disappoint us and she's embraced the mantra of accountability, not perfection. But what we're fighting for is so much bigger than Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or this election. The Working Families Party wants to build durable progressive power for the long haul. And we're doing it with supporters of Warren and Sanders. We're fighting alongside Alicia Garza and Black Futures Lab, which recently came out uh, to support Elizabeth Warren, and Ana Maria Archila and the Center for Popular Democracy, which came out to support Bernie Sanders. We're all comrades working to build a multiracial, multi-generational movement of progressives, delivering on a progressive agenda. Medicaid, Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, a $15 minimum wage, universal childcare, debt-free college, halting deportations and abolishing ICE, and putting power back in the hands of the people not only means putting a progressive in the White House, it also means progressive majorities in the House and Senate to get legislation on the president's desk, putting progressive majorities in our state houses, and putting progressives on county commissions, boards, and district attorney seats all across the country. And it means holding those elected champions accountable when they get there. No matter what happens, I hope we all remember that we are on the same team, working towards the same goals, and being able to come together to discuss two progressive options is a sign we've come a long way together. Thank you. Maurice, do you want to give my clothes? <laughs> so uh, you've already heard half of what I have to say. I'm not going to say it again, except to say, weren't these panelists fantastic? Aren't we incredibly lucky to have such rich, radical thinkers? Uh, such vibrant speakers among us. Okay, so uh, yeah, you've heard what I have to say. I think uh, it's, time to, it's time to vote your hopes, not your fears, whatever those hopes are. Uh, the nation uh, is cogitating and watch this space. I'm gonna close with two commercials. Uh, one, because I began with a commercial for Jackman. So I'm going to end with a commercial for the WFP. I love the WFP. I always have. I always will. Uh, if you don't know their work, you should. If you don't support them, please do. Uh, they are a hugely important part of political life in New York City, and this would be a much poorer city and state without the work they do. So uh, that's, my, that's my first commercial. Uh, and my second commercial, oh, this is, uh, you know, is... Uh, for the Nation magazine, uh, you know. I uh, really can't think of anybody else who could have put a night like this together. 
Uh, thank you, Peter Rothberg, for all the work you did in, in helping us, and everybody else who worked on this at the New School. Uh, but what I think is that you know, the nation has a unique place as a place that's always open to radical thought, but that really is also always interested in making those connections that Bhaskar spoke about uh, between radical thought and between uh, liberal movements. Uh, so, you know, uh, if, if you think that's important, please read us online, www.thenation.com, uh, subscribe, and support us. And thank you all very much for turning out this evening.